Suarikap to Con. Suarikap. Um, by the way, you know, in uh, in uh, worldwide, uh, the um, what do you call it? The uh, New Year's is usually on January 1st, right? <clears throat> January 1st. And um, that's with, uh, you know, using our Gregorian calendar and all that stuff. So anyway, in Thailand, um, they're new, they, they celebrate that also because they love to celebrate. So sure. Um, but I mean, the, their, their, um, their New Year's is coming up this week. It's called Songkran. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's fun. It's uh, what they do is they take, they usually, they, I don't like it at all, but they love it. Um, you, you, if you're walking down the street, you're going to get thrown buckets of water on you. You can't, you can't go anywhere. You, they, they throw water on you. It's like three days. If you're driving your car, they're throwing water all over you and stuff like that. Uh, don't have your windows open, things like that. But if you're young and you're just, it's a lot of fun. They're all the whole thing. The whole country is like that for uh, for three days, throwing water. I guess uh, what's that? Cleansing. You know, and there's another another example of water being used in um, uh, in cleansing and the re renewal of life, um, the ritual, right? So um, that'll bring us right into water fasting and everything. So let, anyway, let's get to the questions today because there are quite a bit, I think. And how does this work? I guess that's okay. Uh, okay. So I just can't, unfortunately I can't see the cat the the, the chat. Uh, what, what, oh, select them is very select crosswalks. Make sure I'm human because AI can't see crosswalks. I think. Okay, there we go. Wow, amazing. So nobody, are we not on, we're not live. We are, are, are I don't know, how do I know if we're live on Facebook? Anyway, I can't see Facebook uh, and YouTube and LinkedIn. I can't see it. It says we're live, but there's no chats coming in. Hmm. Anyway. Whoa. Every time it happens, doesn't it? Okay. So anyway, let's, let's get to um, some questions. Sorry about that. Sorry for being such a, I'm the opposite of a, of a, of a nerd when it comes to this stuff. But anyway, here's, oh, I don't want you to get that big. Okay. So So question, first question, how does, and this is from Instagram. So um, how does, I'm live on Instagram, but am I live on, anybody know if I'm live on Facebook? Or YouTube or anything? Oh, Facebook's live. Okay, cool. All right, whatever. So how does ALA infusions relate to cancer? Does it also help reverse diabetes? Well, you know, that's a good question. Everyone know what ALA is, alpha lipoic acid. Alpha lipoic acid basically is um, uh, an, uh, uh, an extremely powerful um, antioxidant. And remember what an antioxidant is? Everyone remember? So real quickly, um, life is, in a biological sense, is the transfer of electrons right? And when you have electrical flow, you've got life. So biological life is sustained with energy, uh, with the energy coming from electrons in electricity. And, and, and when electricity is flowing in one direction, magnetism is at 90 degrees, and you have an electromagnetic frequency. So that's what humans are. That's what all biological ent entities are, etc. So now, when the electrons stop flowing and you've got flat lines on your EEG, your EKG, and your EMG and all that, then it's over. Okay? It's over. For now. For then. But anyway, so it's the flow of electrons. So anyway, life is all about uh, certain, certain situations, molecules, handing electrons, which are what we would call antioxidants. They hand, they, they provide electrons and oxidants, which take electrons away. 
So he takes it to the enhance it and takes it and enhance it. Anyway, that flow is really necessary. But you got to keep in mind the, the rate at which all this is going. It's going at, well, um, it, if you consider that it takes probably about, I don't know, how many thousands of ATP to run an enzyme. And when you consider the fact let's, that, that enzymes are doing their job at a million times per second, 5 million times per second, 900,000 times per second, and they're using ATP, and ATP is just providing electrons. So what, you can imagine the rate at which all this stuff is happening. So anyway, alpha lipoic acid, which uh, we, you know, we can get from spinach, broccoli, uh, other foods too is yeast. Uh, you can also... Uh, the <clears throat> For the ghouls of you out there, the ghouls, uh, and you like to eat corpses, uh, you can get it from uh, eating a corpse as well and uh, eating the liver of a corpse. Yeah, uh, but I I kind of, I don't know, I'm just kind of drawn to spinach and broccoli for my ALA. Actually, we make it ourselves, okay? So it's both a fat-soluble, and that's what makes it so amazing. It's a fat-soluble and a water-soluble. Uh, it's got two ends, right? So it can go anywhere, right? Now, it's normally made in our bodies in the mitochondria, right? Remember, mitochondria, those are the little organelles inside of our uh, cells that produce energy, that produce ATP, right? Right. Okay, so uh, uh, So anyway, so <clears throat> it's, um, what does it do, ALA? Uh, well, but number one, it it, it re, probably the most it's most well known for the fact that it recycles all the other antioxidants. So it recycles vitamin E, recycles vitamin A, recycles glutathione. It keeps glutathione because you realize when glutathione uh, does what it does, it loses its ability to do it again. Right. So when glutathione detoxifies. It loses its electrons, and then here's the, here's the ALA coming back to re, to wake it up again. It does the same with vitamin C, vitamin A, vitamin E. So it's very important, very important. So it does that. It also chelates minerals. All right, and and it's also um, uh, improves glucose metabolism, de uh, decreases insulin resistance. So yes, so the question with diabetes is absolutely yes. It decreases insulin resistance, improves insulin. Because it's involved in the pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme system, you know. Now, remember, uh, if you don't recall, that, well, we've probably discussed it before, but when glucose enters a cell and it gets turned into pyruvate, pyruvate's got to get now into the uh, mitochondria to go through what we call oxidative phosphorylation and produce 38 ATP. If it doesn't, if, if that's what cancer, the road to cancer is the pyruvate gets converted to lactate or lactic acid and that's a different thing that's called fermentation glycolysis etc so the uh the pyruvate dehydrogenase molecule system enzyme system is connected to ala so ala upregulates it and takes you away from glycolysis now it's just amazing amazing stuff and so it and, and therefore um it, it 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 if you were to use it with dca everyone know what dca is dichloroacetic acid. So if you were to use ALA with DCA, you're going to get, because the DCA also pushes, pushes the metabolism away from fermentation into the mitochondria. Remember, cancer cells have mitochondria. They don't have as many and they don't rely on it. And even if there's plenty of oxygen around, um, they, they still going to ferment. You know, that's what, that, that, that's what makes them peculiar. They're still going to ferment. Okay. So DCA uh, uh, dichloroacetate, which I think we've discussed in the past, and it is, um, it's a small molecule <clears throat> that's used with, you, it was originally used for children that were born with um, uh, uh, a, a block in that enzyme system. And so they were always in acidosis. They were always producing acidosis acid in their muscles and they're all over their body. So when they'd wake up in the morning, they feel like they just ran the marathon 
and weren't and and hadn't trained for it, right? So they're just achy all over. Anyway, dichloroacetate shifts it up into mitochondria. Okay, so that's very good. So if you're using that with the ALA, that's really fantastic. And that's what you want to do with cancer, right? But it also turns out that it regenerates the liver big time. It's probably one of the best. So if you have a combination of, and this is this all this work came out of uh, uh, I guess the NIH back in the 70s, there was a there was a doctor, um, an MD, PhD by the name of Bert Berkson, and uh, <clears throat> who I, I got to know pretty, you know, he's a great guy. He was in um, New Mexico, right near us in, uh, er, you know, Arizona. Um, but anyway, I met him at a conference. We were both lecturing there. We met afterwards. It was uh, amazing. And, um, and I, I didn't know about him before that. Anyway, what he did in the 70s um, uh, was I- incredible. He and this one other guy um, took 79 patients who had cirrhosis of the liver. You know, and you all know that cirrhosis of the liver, we were told, right? We all believe that cirrhosis of the liver is the end. You can't, you've got to go on the liver transplant list. All right. Um, anyway, seven, uh, and they treated them with, the, with ALA in the study and uh, 75 out of the 79 had their livers come back to normal. That's crazy, unheard of. Any, that's, anyway, that's the regenerative power it has on a liver. So that's really, really important for people dealing with cancer because or dealing with chronically fermenting cells. Let's not use that word, uh, chronically fermenting cells, um, is because it um, re- regenerates the liver <clears throat> helps the liver regenerate, upregulates phase two detoxification, which is really cool, right? Which is what we want, which is what we also get from broccoli and uh, other cruciferous vegetable. Uh, and phase two detoxification of our liver is what gets finally gets the toxins out of our body. So very, very important, okay? So anyway, it does that. But ALA also is um, 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 what, what, what they wound up adding to it was silymarin and selenium. And y'all know that y'all have heard about selenium. <clears throat> selenium is a mineral. And as we discussed before, there are 36 <clears throat> with 21 zeros after it, septillion, 36 septillion chemical reactions going on in our bodies every second. And they're mediated by enzymes. Okay. And these enzymes are powered by um, um, uh, ATP. But anyway, Every enzyme, in order to get the energy into it, like the battery pack to get it in into the enzyme, requires a mineral. That's why selenium is associated with glutathione and you know zinc and copper and uh, every mineral you can think of has <clears throat> or functions in different enzyme systems. And that's and there <clears throat> therein lies the big problem with heavy metals. So when you have when you have heavy metal exposure, like a lead, mercury, um, you know tin, some of these other heavy metals, and they get into your body, arsenic, they get into your body, they're going to replace because they have a stronger, they're heavy metals, they have a stronger um, uh, charge, they can replace the selenium. So you get lead into your uh, glutathione, it's not going to work. You get it into, you know, whatever. So that's why heavy metal can affect all parts of the body, all, all systems in the body. All right? Okay, good. Uh, social comments display here click on them to showcase on stream um <clears throat> Technology and me, you know, I mean, this stuff here and me just, it's just, I'll never get it. I'll never get it. It's, I'll never get it. I, you know, c- complex biochemistry, I love. I love it. It's interesting. This is not interesting. Hi from Connecticut. Hey there. Fantastic. So I'm glad you all made it. And uh, what? I keep getting yellow bile in my stomach when water fasting. Drink more, drink more and more, 
drink more water and put in a lot. I, you, so you, if you're getting yellow bile in your stomach, that means it must be coming up. It's the only way you would know it was yellow. You're vomiting. Um, so I don't really know your condition, so I really can't tell you what to do. Uh, but usually you just drink more water and then twice a day, you take a half a glass of water with a half a teaspoon or a little bit more of Himalayan sea salt, shake it up and drink it so that you get lots of keep, keep your electrolytes and all that. And I'm not, I'm not sure what you're doing, but usually whenever you're getting a crisis in fasting, you can just get through it by drinking more water and resting and relaxing and don't, don't worry about it. Read books on fasting, read books on fasting, read books on fasting, because you need to be reminded in here that what you're doing, what you're, <clears throat> what you're, what a fast is, is a very, very powerful second to none way to heal. Okay. So I'm not sure of your situation, but, and I, and, and you might be, I don't know what's going on. So I really can't advise you specifically, but that's what I usually get people to, who drink through it. Or you get to a doctor if you, and if you find that you can't drink because you're vomiting, get to a doctor and have them give you IV fluids just to keep you hydrated, and then you can get past that part. Okay, that's what we do when we when we uh, um, um, supervise fasts. Um, there'll be points because after about 12 days, 13 days, 10 days, even uh, people water gets boring and people don't drink enough. They wind up getting. You're on tamoxifen and it hurts. Well, we're going to talk about tamoxifen in a little bit. Okay. Uh, anyway, so <clears throat> so they've got the mechanism by which ALA inhibits uh, cirrhosis. It blocks TGF beta and SMAD3. These these are the pathways, um, uh, and they you know and they learn that by giving carbon tetrachloride to uh, to rats. Carbon tetrachloride is this uh, chemical. I forget where it's used, but it's used in, I forget where it's used. But anyway, uh, it's, it's one of those things, if you get it on your hands, you absorb it. And then it goes in and it wipes out your liver. So they got these rats, they gave them the carbon tetrachloride, well, you know, um, and uh, this reversed it, reversed the cirrhosis from it. All right, pretty good, pretty good. So you can imagine, if that's what it does with cirrhosis, imagine if you if you have liver metastasis, um, then it's, it's going to help a lot, okay? Now, um, it's, you know, the other thing about alpha lipoic acid, as I said, it's made normally in the mitochondria, okay? Uh, and it's involved in like four enzyme systems there. And it's necessary for carbohydrate metabolism. It's necessary for protein metabolism. So the question that, in the, that, that the person asked was, uh, okay, so how, how important is it? You know, what is its value with, with cancer as well? So the, the, the value with cancer is that that's what it does. It does all, it, uh, you know, your, your liver uh, uh, helps with carbohydrate and protein metabolism, lowers your fasting insulin levels, right? It makes your cells more, um, uh, more sensitive to insulin rather than resistant to insulin. But it also, um, um, uh, and they did, they've done the, they've worked on, they've done alpha lipoic acid with different cancers, thyroid cancer, uh, colon cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, um, um, and it actually blocks, stops um, proliferated growth and puts the cells into apoptosis. So very, very important, you think? Um, yeah, and they figured out what it is. You know, there's these protein tyrosine phosphatases enzyme systems that get upregulated, especially with breast, um, and it knocks them down, knocks them down. So it's pretty, pretty amazing pretty amazing ALA. So what we do is we always give it after, since it recycles vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin C. So anyway, yeah, but I just wanted to let you know that it not only uh, it inhibits uh, uh, the two things that it does that's very, very important is it inhibits uh, uh, um, proliferation of growth of the, of the tumors and spreading and metastasis. So really important. And you can take it. And then the other, oh, the other great thing I forgot to mention is that uh, uh, because it increases uh, the work it does with um, the ability with glucose uh, is it actually works with neurons and improves the, the, uh, the glucose metabolism in neurons and helps neurons repair. And so it's actually approved in Germany for uh, diabetic neuropathy. Now, you, now diabetic neuropathy... Um, is not worse 
than neuropathy you get from cisplatin or oxaloplatin or, you know, a lot of the other chemotherapies. So if you've got a neuropathy, uh, you know, think of alpha lipoic acid. So what you would take is, um, I, what I would, what I would say is, uh, you know, there, there's different studies that did different things, but 600 milligrams, four times, uh, three times a day. If you have a neuropathy, if you have a, if you have a peripheral neuropathy, take that, take the selenium and also take the, uh, you know, silly marin, that's for your liver. You want your liver always to be good and you can get silly marin or you can get silly binum right there, there, which is a, which, which is one of the parts from the silly marin. Yeah. 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 So really good. Uh, so really amazing. Yeah. Amazing. ALA, alpha lipoic acid. So we usually give it as an infusion normally to, uh, after every vitamin C. Why? Cause we want it. Why? We want it to be kept. You want, we want it to continue. You know, if you keep recycling that vitamin C, when that vitamin, when you get done with your drip, right, you're done with your drip and you go home, but you've got the ALA, it's recycling it. It's keeping it alive. It's keeping it working. Plus you're sipping seven to seven, right? Everybody's sipping seven to seven. You're putting eight to 10 to 12 grams of, of, a, of a sodium ascorbate in, in, a, in water, a liter of water, and you're sipping at seven to seven, so you slowly absorb it, right? All right. It tastes a little bit salty. It's no big deal. A little bit salty, not a lot. Yeah, yeah. So um, where was our other question? Okay. Wait, we don't want you to do that big. Here we go. Okay, so here we go. Now. What do you think of McClellan's protocol? Well, I mean, it's fantastic. I mean, uh, in fact, what 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 she did, Jane McClellan, um, as you all know, she had she had uh, stage four breast cancer, um, and um, was able to come out of it using when she when she wrote the book How to Starve Cancer, and basically she was looking at it from a metabolic standpoint. And it turns out that the care oncology group that you've all, many of you have heard of, I think, I think that's in, out of London. Uh, they uh, really prescribe four basic drugs, mebendazole, metformin, uh, mebendazole, metformin, a statin of some kind, and um, doxycycline. So she was pretty much the same, except that uh, I think she also worked, used... Uh, uh, diperidamol, diperidamol, yeah, why is that weird to say, anyway, um, actually blocks the cancer from uptaking amino acids and making, and proteins and things like that, so that it helps, actually limits its ability to grow, blocks it from growing, right, so it's very good, so, um, um, but we also use diperidamol, Peridamol in uh, um, painful urinary tract infections, right? You ever have that where you get where you, it really hurts to pee? Well, that actually you take that and within no less than an hour, it'll start to feel better when you pee. It won't burn. It won't burn. The urine will turn really orange, and but it helps really a lot. Anyway, um, so I think what she. What she came, I, and I give her so much credit because I think she kind of started the whole idea of the of the repurposed drugs, right? And the doxycycline is amazing. Mebendazole is amazing, but we would use more than just mebendazole. But mebendazole is amazing. Um, uh, it stimulates apoptosis and it causes cell cycle arrest. In other words, stop, it just stops the cells from proliferating. Kind of cool. Now, remember, mebendazole is in a class of drugs called benzimidazoles, right? And so that, its cousin or sister or brother is fenbendazole, and uh, so uh, used for uh, their antiparasitics. But so they do many other things, not just that, not just um, <clears throat> uh, cell cycle arrest and um, uh, apoptosis and not just that, but they turn off lots of different cancer pathways. They're very, very amazing. And they get rid of parasites, which parasites, remember, in us are always, they. what they do is they set up their environment so that they can be comfortable. And the environment in that they set up, that they establish, is the same environment the cancer needs. So they kind of symbiotic in that, in that way. And so, and now we're finding more and more and more and more and more and more parasites associated with cancer. 
and also not only that, but but funguses and all my, microorganisms. And basically, you know, I think we're going to probably come down to realizing it's all microorganisms. Everything that's happening is microorganisms, both on the positive and the negative sides. The microorganisms are they're everywhere. They do everything. They keep us alive and then they kill us. They recycle us. I mean, they're just, it's what they, I mean, the brain of biology is microorganisms. They're the brain of biology. They're the intelligence of biology. They're how all the other biology, it's how that big, big elephant exists because of the uh, it's of the soil. It, it, without the micro, there's no soil. The carbon, the nitrogen. I mean, what? They do everything. So anyway, so um, so I like Jay McClellan's uh, protocol. But you got to do more. Remember the thing about cancer. Okay, really, uh, kind of. Uh, how does this work? Really, um, there we go. Can we do that? There we go. Does that work? Yeah. There we go. Yeah, yeah. The uh, thing about cancer is, well, the thing about cancer is you cannot outsmart it. Come on. Okay. So the thing about cancer is you cannot outsmart it, okay? Because it's pretty clever. It's it it, it 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 it's working out every day. Remember, it's try it's it it's in survival mode because it lost its mitochondria. So it's very very adept at adapting. You know, so you throw this poison at it, you throw this po you can't. It's not going to work. It's going to figure out a way around it. So what you do with cancer is you exhaust it and remove its ability to uh, to to metabolize. Right. You, you exhaust it. You do several things at, at a time. So what Jay McClellan's doing. Yeah. The statins use the statins. The statins are amazing in what they do. Um, and uh, uh, what else besides statins? Uh, you know, what one, you know, the stat, you know, the, the reason is, is cancer cells are multiplying quickly. Right. So the, the way the statins help is that they have, obviously they're going to block cholesterol formation in the cancer cell. Why is that important? Because cholesterol is necessary for all non-plant and non-microorganisms make cholesterol now i mean plants do too in, in, a, in a different way yeah they actually they actually do them but i mean uh, all animals they don't they don't use it in their cell surface like we do plants have cell walls so it's a whole different story they have these rigid cell walls that which is why which is why when you eat broccoli uh or you eat cauliflower or you eat um uh, uh, Kale, any any of the cruciferous vegetables, between one cell will have an enzyme called myrosinase. Another 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 cell, which has got a cell wall between them, will have the glucosinolate. Right. So then, when the when the insect bites into it, or when we bite into it, they mix become isothiocyanates, which are poison to insects and the best medicine in the world for us. Right. Yeah. Anyway, so plants have cell walls, whereas animals have plasma membranes. Okay, now um, in our plasma membrane, we need cholesterol to maintain the shape and the fluidity and all that. It also the cholesterol in the plasma membrane of our cells is also serves as to protect the cell from to protect the membrane from beginning oxidized. Right, which is called peroxidation when you're talking about lipids, fats getting oxidized. So it pre prevents that. And so you will upregulate and produce more cholesterol if you get exposed to radiation, if you get exposed to uh, anything else that is uh, going to potentially damage the cells. You're going to upregulate your cholesterol as a protective mechanism. Okay. Well, cancer cells need it, and they need more because they're re remember they're reproducing faster. Um, and uh, so they can't. It really blocks them from reproducing. But the other thing that statins do, which is crazy, is that it uh, <clears throat> it uh, kind of sits and blocks 
the GLUT1 receptor. We've talked about the GLUT1 receptor in the past. Okay, so cancer, so, okay. You guys remind me not to use that ridiculous word. It's a Rockefeller word, okay? Cancer is a Rockefeller word. Okay, it probably was cool at one time and whatever, when it was whoever first thought of it, but, um, you know, it became Rockefellerized and it's, it's now a deadly, bad, horrible thing. So chronically fermenting cells uh, are, uh, they need more glucose. They need 19 times more glucose in order to survive. So, so in order for that to happen, it upregulates certain insulin receptors, upregulates uh, an enzyme called um, um, glucosidase, glucosidases, the, the glucosidases, which grabs glucose off of other molecules. Um, and anyway, it upregulates a lot of things, downregulates a lot of things and all that. So anyway, um, one of the things that upregulates is GLUT1. GLUT1, there's GLUT1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, these are different kinds of receptors that bring in different things, right? Now, GLUT5, as you remember, um, is the uh, docking place and the <laughs> receptor and allows it to come in for fructose. GLUT1 is glucose. Well, anyway, statin blocks that. So that's good. Doxy, I mean, all of, we could go into the details of all these, but let's not. Let's just understand that, the, that, the, that these repurposed drugs are fantastic. Um, I mean, normally I don't like uh, drugs, but with when you have chronically fermenting condition in your body, we've got it. You know, you got we got that condition because we live in a really unnatural, ridiculous, artificial world. I mean, th this world we live in is absurd. Do you know how absurd this world is? You know, right? You all know how absurd this world is. <clears throat> it's absurd. Think about it. Wherever you are right now, wherever you are, you're in a box. An artificial box, right? Now, God gave us an earth, a fantastic, amazing place. And we said, nah, nah, no thanks. Nah. nah. And, uh, uh, and the soil, ah, I don't want the soil on me. In fact, I'm not going to even call it soil, right? In English, I think, I think in other languages, you might be more kind and less blasphemous than we are in English. But in English, we call soil dirt. And dirt, by the way, is a pejorative term. It's not a, it's not a nice term, right? I mean, it's pejorative. So, uh, yeah, you, uh, to say someone's dirty uh, means they got to go clean themselves or clean their mouth out, right? Um, or whatever. Um, oh, you're dirty. Go wash your clothes. You're, oh, you're dirty. Go take a shower, blah, 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 blah. Well, d dirt, dirt, dirt. Earth. How about you're earthy? How about you're... You, you, uh, your mom, you're, you come in the house, you're like six years old, and you've been playing outside, and you got this earth all over you, and your mother says, you look wonderfully earthy today. Wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't that be cool instead of dirty? Oh, my God, you're dirty. Let's get you out And, oh, my God, God forbid you get some earth on your food. Oh, my God. We can't eat that now. Oh, throw it out. Uh, anyway, we're, we're insane. We're insane. I don't know how we, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you wonder why we're all sick, why we get sick, this is why we get sick. So we live in these boxes. We're communicating with these machines. I don't know. Somehow everybody, a lot of people think that's really cool. We've really come a long way. Yeah, we have. <clears throat> We've come a long way. Um, no, I, I don't think necessarily within our best interest. Um, but anyway. So now, question, is a tumor starting to hurt or feeling different necessarily a bad thing? No, not necessarily a bad thing. It can be breaking up, uh, you know, and, uh, and that's what happens, right? So thoughts on, on mushroom or HPV I'll look at your question though. It was it was just frozen. Questions over on TikTok. No, it was frozen. Huh? Okay. Uh, anyway, remind me that mushrooms. There's every guy remind me because you're gonna get you're gonna go away. It's gonna go away. But uh, anyway, uh, what was I talking about? I get so distracted by this stuff. 
Oh, so no, a tumor, a tumor. Depending on what's happening, you know, really, we're talking about what? We're we talking about breast, pancreas. Pancreatic tumors hurt a lot because they're 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 kind of releasing enzymes and causing some some destruction of the cells around that and causing pain. Um, you know, so pain can be because it's growing and it, compressing other things, um, and it can be breaking down. But usually, uh, if it's changing, like if it's just getting smaller, it can break up. Like a hard tumor can break up into different because the central parts become necrotic. And it can break up and they can move aside, move apart and come like that. And kind of, it kind of the way it dissolves, that could be happening. But usually that's not a lot of pain. So anyway. Yeah. I would say that if your tumor is hurting, um, I, I would think well we got to do more and if it's a tumor like a breast or a thyroid or somewhere out on the body where you can get at it you know uh, paint paint iodine on it um and uh, maybe have a holistic doctor who's uh, knows how to do that inject it with ozone ozone will, will, will dissolve it shrink it down quicker okay elena um can uterine fibroids turn into chron chronically fermenting cells? Uh, well, okay, a fibroid is basically um, um, a benign, benign. Benign meaning benign as opposed to malignant. Malignant means keeps growing and then it spreads, it metastasizes. So benign means it might keep growing, but it's not going to metastasize. So it doesn't go to other organs. So it's benign. Uh, I mean, a, 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 a mole is a benign tumor. I mean, tumor just means growth, raised, raised growth, uh, increased cellular um, density, things like that. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it is, uh, uh, it's not, it is not malignant. So that's what a fibroid is. And it is of the uterine, the muscle in the uterus. Now, if it's extremely rare for the the answer is the answer is no except maybe one in ten thousand hundred thousand can become what's called a fibrosarcoma which is where the muscle of which is where the fibroid which is just a excessive growth of the muscle remember the uterus is uh made of muscle right? Because it contracts, right? And the baby comes out and all that. Um, uh, but it's also lined with all kinds of blood vessels and nurturing uh, cells and things like that. It's much different, right? Than the muscle. The muscle just kind of helps it contract and have the baby come out. Okay. So when the muscle part uh, grows, you, it's called a fibroid. And of course, uh, being in the uterus, being part of the female reproductive apparatus it it has estrogen receptors and so lots of estrogen will make fibroids when you if you have excess estrogen because and not enough progesterone to balance it out you're you're what they call estrogen dominant then you can get fibroids no the mostly never become fibrosarcomas but they do i've seen how many have I seen in my time? Uh, maybe eight. I've only seen about eight, ten. Not a lot. Not a lot. And and the ones I saw didn't didn't start out as a fibroid. Maybe one or two did. One. Nah, none of them did. They were all. They just started. They just immediately had. A fibrosarcoma. They didn't they didn't go fibroid to fibroid to fibrosarcoma. So that, that's it. So I wouldn't do it. So what do you got to do, lady from Fibro Cy Cyprus? You got to eat really healthy, live really healthy, go to bed early. You got to do all those things. That's what you got to do. Okay, that's what you got to do. Okay. So I'm trying to get everybody from the same angle, except I don't got the. So anyway, so that's it. Uh <clears throat> uterine fibroids. Uh, become chronically fermenting cells. 
Now, so therefore, you're going to eat really healthy. You're going to go to sleep early. You're going to move around all day. You're going to have, you're going to clean up any uh, toxic relationships you have. And those are hard. Those are probably the hardest. Cleaning up our toxic relationships and um, um, controlling the mind, learning to turn it off. <clears throat> so, anyway. Now, how important is it to measure the urine pH? Well, you all know that, I mean, I mean, a lot of people are measuring. <clears throat> Wait, what is this thing here? I was told I had many small fibroids and not to worry. However, when I had the hysterectomy, the surgeon found a cancerous 4 by 7 tumor. Ah, was that a fibrosarcoma or was it an endometrial? be interested to see your answer there was it a fibrosarcoma or was it an endometrial carcinoma anyway if you'll answer me i'll find the answer to that um but i'm just saying it's rare it's rare it's rare so how, how important is it to measure urine ph well a lot of people measure urine ph thinking that that's a reflection somehow of uh uh, they do it as, as a way to monitor their progress in alkalinizing their body because they've heard that being alkaline is really good. It's, really, it's good. And um, we've, I think we've talked about this many times, but uh, our body, the, what needs to be alkaline is our blood and our interstitial fluid. That is the fluid. That... Anyway. Our interstitial fluid, um, which is the fluid that surrounds the cells, that has to be alkaline. The pH of 7.4, which is average. 3.7.3, 3, 3, 7 to 7.45, 4, and 7.4 is in the middle. Okay. But every other part in our body is, and, and space and stuff like that has different pH requirements, right? We've talked about that. Stomach, colon, blah, blah, need to be acidic. To adenum needs to be alkaline, etc. So there's, all, you know, you can't just uh, we have, can't you can't be all alkaline. There's acid. Acid is going back and forth, just like electrons are going back and forth. Remember, acid pH is a measure of the of hydrogen concentration in fluids in a substance. Okay, now a hydrogen an, is a hydrogen ion is acidic but it's also like an oxidant in that it grabs electrons and that's what makes acid dangerous whereas alkaline has extra electrons and gives it just like an antioxidant so you can lay the ph scale and you can lay the uh um the redox scale and the voltage scale all there together and what they're all the same thing they're just different ways of looking at the same phenomenon um but um so measuring the urine pH is uh, um, the problem is you, you, you one of the big most important jobs of the uh, of the kidneys is to get rid of acid. So it's producing acid, and we need and we need yeah. So what was what's very interesting is that um, so our normal pH is actually somewhere between six and seven point five, right? Some people go down as low as. 4.8 is normal. I mean, I guess it depends on the population of people up to 7.8. Okay. Well, here's the thing. If you have like way over seven, you could have this. There's a, there's a bacteria called Proteus mirabilis, which will produce a lot of alkaline, an extremely alkaline urine. So, uh, and, and, you know, so that, you know, so you could have like a, have a UTI with Proteus which would give you a very alkaline urine. That's kind of weird, right? Yeah. Okay. But again, remember too, what influences um, the pH of your urine? Because your, your, your kidney's job, one of the jobs of the kidneys is to get rid of acid and help maintain a, a, a appropriate pH, right? So uh, diet can do it. So grain, soda, you know, fish, and animal protein, all of that 
will make you uh, will make your urine acidic. Whereas uh, vegetables, plants, nuts, fruits make your urine alkaline. So changing diet is going to change your the pH of your urine. Okay. And then there are medical conditions that you 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 know you, you that that uh, do it as well. I mean, um, you know, kidney stones and uh, certain a, a sick diabetic who's getting into ketoacidosis or uh, dehydration can do it. Acidosis can do it. Um, diarrhea can do it, can make your, uh, the pH of your urine low, right? Uh, and then you can also go really high and get too high of it by what we talked about before with, if you have a UTI with Proteus mirabilis, but also kidney failure, just because you're no longer able to get rid of your, um, your acids. So it's alkaline, very alkaline. Gastric suctioning, if they're doing gastric su suctioning, if you're in the hospital. Um, Respiratory alkalosis. Respiratory alkalosis happens when you like over breathe. <sighs> you know, people do that. And uh, I remember I remember kids doing that for fun because it gets them lightheaded and they faint and stuff like that. They like it. You just breathe like that. So you get you get you get it's called respiratory alkalosis. But other things, urinary tract infections, uh, pyloric obstruction, kidney tubular acidosis. Uh, yeah. Acute tubular acidosis, which happens from dehydration, all those things can result in uh, a high pH. That and that it's not necessarily coming from the fact that you're healthy. So I don't use the pH of the urine because it's not telling me a whole lot. And there's too many potential variables. But it definitely doesn't say, okay, oh well, my pH of my urine is high, so I'm my my body's all alkaline. Well. No, no, no. Your body is kept very strictly within 7.35 to 7.45. Your blood, your interstitial fluid. Ah, however, your colon pH is kept at 6.8. Uh, if you have enough acidophilus, if you have enough um, probiotics in there. Your stomach pH is 1.5 to 2, hopefully, which is extremely acidic. So anyway, okay, so that's that. Uh, let's see, where's another question? Can you discuss how ozone treatment helps to eliminate chronically fermenting cells? You guys are so much better than me. My God, you're all remembering the name. Okay. Uh, so ozone. Okay, ozone uh, used in Europe for years, years, decades, hundred over 100 years maybe. So ozone is O3. Oxygen is O2. Oxygen is stable because uh, the two oxygen molecules, O2, are sharing electrons in a very balanced way. But you put another one on there and you got O3, and now you got some X. It's like, uh, anyway. so it's extremely um, oxidizing. It's a very oxidizing. And that's why they use it now for the Olympic pools, uh, all that, because it's like, uh, it's so powerful as an antimicrobial, um, like 100,000 times more than chlorine right so anyway but using it but but medical ozone has been used uh for a long time in europe and italy and uh, you know so um now medical ozone does a lot of things and there's different ways you can do it you can do rectal insufflation vaginal ozone you can do um, blood, direct gas injections of ozone you got to be very careful with that you have to have someone who really knows what they're doing because you don't want to get an ozone air embolus um, to your lungs. It's not good. Well, you, uh, you have a hard time breathing. But they have to do it very slowly, but ozone gas. And then there's what they call major autohemal, where they take out 200 cc's of blood, put in 200, uh, 200 cc's of um, ozone, mix it slowly, and then let it go back in. And then there's another one called, uh, there's the 10 pass, which basically is ec extra uh, um, uh pressure so it's hyperbaric pressure so that you don't have to use so much um heparin and you don't have to get because uh, that's the problem with ozone uh when you take when, you, when you're doing ozone treatments when you take the blood out into into a uh, glass container um it's gonna clot you gotta have the heparin in there to prevent it from clotting so you can do that once but you can't do it twice three times you're gonna start one getting up too much heparin and you'll start bleeding out of everywhere and inside everywhere so that's why they came up with the 10 pass, which is uh, out of Germany, 
where they use the hyperbaric, and now they have the Ebo, where they're basically it's being dialyzed. So they're really great strides with ozone. But how, you know, how does it help? Um, when you do the ozone, um, usually what happens is now ozone doesn't last very long. Like an, uh, not a second, not even a second, right? It's done. It's done. Whatever it's going to do. Uh, but it does several things. One thing is that ozone stimulates. Um, uh, uh, well, okay, when it dissolves in the blood, right? Two ozone molecules, which is O3, become three O2s, which is oxygen. So two ozones become three oxygens. So you increase the oxygenation. Okay, understand that? That's very really cool. So you increase the oxygenation of the of, of the of the uh, non uh, of the blood of the blood. Okay. Now, the other thing it is is it starts to the ozone um, if it's in that blood will start to oxidize the white blood cells, and they say no way, man, and they start producing all of their powerful antioxidant enzymes, and it turns on all this stuff. So that that's that that's kind of the beauty of the, of what it does. So. Mostly what happens, the work of the ozone um, is in these second messengers. In other words, uh, it goes through, there's this uh, reaction called the, the Kriege, Kriege reaction, right? Where it's between ozone and uh, one of the polyunsaturated fatty acids it runs into in the cell membranes, right? And it turns stuff into 4-HNE, um, hy hydrogen peroxide, lipoperoxides, things like that. And all of those things, and even produces aldehydes and things like that. So these things run around and they're highly, highly oxidative. Why is that important? Because they that's the same thing you're doing with chemo and radiation. You're trying to oxidize the, cell, the cancer cells, the, the chronically fermenting cells, so that they become, um, so that they die. So if you can oxidize the, the, the CFCs, then they will die. And um, that's the goal. All right? So... Ozone can also be used as an adjunct with if someone's getting chemotherapy or radiotherapy, right? It's adjunctive because it's doing the same thing, at a, you know. But not, not, not in a toxic way. That's the beauty thing, beautiful thing about it. But it, another thing it does is it, for red blood cells is it upregulates an enzyme called 2,3-DPG. And the reason that's important is because the more 2,3-DPG you have in your red blood cell, when it when that red blood cell, you know, because, you know, red blood cells, you guys, in case you don't know, red blood cells are like the only cells in our body that don't have nuclei. No nucleus. That's why they only live 120 days. That's why we got to always be making more. But they have no nuclei so that they're not rigid. So they're, 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 they kind of like have, you know, if, if you were to look at them, they kind of have, you know, rounded edges. And then in the middle, it goes down. Right. And that allows them to fold and squeeze and get into the little arterioles. Arterioles. How small are arterioles? You are, you've got your aorta, which becomes your, you know, arteries that go to your kidneys, your liver, all the different things. Arteries become smaller and smaller and smaller until they become arterioles. Arterioles. Uh, and then you have capillaries, and then you have venules, which go to veins and back to veins. That's the system, okay? But the arterioles, 10 of them, 10 arterioles is the same width as one hair. And these are small guys, and but they've all got muscles in them, and they're all, blah, 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 you know, regulating things. By the way, just as an aside, in case... You wanted to know the spike protein poisoning. Uh, that's one of the things it does is it disrupts the uh, microvasculature, disrupts the blood brain barrier. I mean, in, in addition to causing coagulation, in addition to causing uh, cancer, all sorts of things. Probably the most toxic molecule that human beings have ever been exposed to, ever is the spike protein. And when I get a rumble channel someday, I'm going to be able to tell you everything I, I know about that stuff. I can't really do it now.
Um, anyway, so so that so that's what it does. So 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 the uh, the um, the ozone does that. It upregulates two three dBG, so you have more. So that means when okay, so I, I didn't even say it. So the red blood cells negotiate. They get their way through. They're in, they have to go into the capillary. They go into the capillary. You know, how small capillaries are. Wow. Anyway, because the arterioles feed the capillaries, and then they go into the capillaries. And then the capillary is just a thin. It doesn't have any muscles in it or anything. It's just one layer of cell thick. So when it's when the red blood cells in there, that's when the oxygen comes out and the carbon dioxide goes back and you know, it goes like that. It exchanges in there. But in order for the there's a lot of factors that determine whether or not or how quickly or how much of the uh, oxygen will be transferred into the cells. Uh, one of them is an enzyme in the red blood cell called 2,3-DBG. And if you increase that, you're going to increase delivery of oxygen. Very, very important. And if you're eating healthy and you've got omega-6s, 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 walnuts, you know, sunflower, you know, um, they're in everything. I mean, chia has got uh, omega six to three, uh, three ratio, three to one ratio of si uh, omega six is the three. Um, so, um, I mean, um, three to one ratio of omega threes to six. However, however, it's got the sixes, the healthy sixes, not the sixes, not the omega sixes you get from French fries, and not the omega sixes you get from other foods that are that are that are unhealthy. No, but these are the healthy omega sixes. But anyway, if you have enough omega six in your on your on your cell membranes, your plasma membrane, what do we get from that? That is like just like insulin opens the door to let glucose into the cell. The omega six is allows oxygen into the cell. So you upregulate your two three dpg with ozone, and you have to be someone who's smart enough to eat human food. You're going to have a lot of omega-6s. You That oxygen is going to get in. So that really doesn't matter. You could be wearing oxygen here and do, while working out and all that sort of stuff. If you don't have any omega-6s, you're not getting the oxygen to the cells. And if you can't upregulate your 2-3-DPG, two, 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 doesn't work. Yeah. You know, so the other thing is um, the, uh, uh, you know, one of the ways in which the ozone does what it does is it, it, it for those of you that are like, uh, like, like, enjoy the biochemistry of it all which i do I really do but anyway it says it's um the nrf2 you ever hear of the nrf2 anyway nrf2 is the gene kind of that controls the or pre results in the um in the turning on of all of the anti antioxidant response elements which are all kinds of systems all kinds of uh, uh enzymes all right ares I mean, then NRF2 does that and ozone turns that on. So that means now all of your cells get really turned on with antioxidants. Okay. Um, so it's, it does, it's just amazing, amazing thing. And then finally, you know, one of the things that ozone does is it improves the gas exchange in your lungs. In other words, gas exchange, getting rid of the carbon dioxide and getting in the oxygen, it improves that. So, I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's a great Wonderful, wonderful. And remember, we talked about minor autohemo. Minor autohemo, and you can get your doctor to do it. It doesn't take a lot of training at all, really. I mean, kind of just, but, you know, you take out five cc's of blood from your port or wherever, and you put in another five cc's of um, ozone, or you can do 10 cc's and 10 cc's. That's a lot. Five and five is better. And then shake it vigorously, and then give your, and then get a shot in the butt or the arm. Butt better. better. Uh, usually, our arms, are, our butts are bigger than our arms. The muscle, in fact, the gluteus uh, is probably the biggest muscle in our body. It's what keeps us upright, and it's what gives us a booty. Those uh, people that still are young enough to have a booty, it's a uh, gluteus. Um, Anyway, so anyway, that's what ozone. So uh, the question was, how does it work with chronically fermenting cells? That's what it does. It oxidizes, and basically it kills them. But they've done studies where they've, done, of course, in vitro, but it kills it very small amounts of it. But when you get it, remember, when you get it either, however you get it, it produces a secondary, um, uh, me second messengers that go and they 
they turn on and turn off things and they they so they and they increase the oxygenation and they you know oxygen delivery they just do all the in other words it's an oxidative therapy it's really 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 good but you got to do it a right so if you're getting ebo do it once a week or you, twice a week even uh 10 pass you can do it even twice a week three times a week but um if you're doing the mah the mah you know where you take the blood out and you got to uh, you got to do that five, at least five times a week to make it really, really work well for you. Okay. So let's see what our next question is. Can you please explain TA1? Okay. So TA1, we've talked about before. It, uh, thymus and alpha-1 is a peptide, 28 amino acids. Peptides are amino acids. Proteins are amino acids. A peptide has 50 or less amino acids. A protein has 100 or more amino acids. All right. So, um, so thymus and alpha-1 is a peptide produced in the thymus gland. The thymus gland sits right up, up here below your chest bone, okay? <clears throat> and um, it's really big when we're young, and then it gets, I think it gets to its full, full maximum weight in early adolescence, and then phew, begins to involute, shrink, and the gland starts getting surrounded by fat, and then the fat thick, and then the, the smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller every year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what's the big deal? Well, the thymus gland is a T. The thymus begins with a T, and that's where T cells are made. T cells are needed to kill cancer and also to control uh, these, uh, what they call, uh, uh, they're called viruses, but we, we know they're really exosomes. But anyway, it controls them, and you need T cells for them. I'm talking about the uh, external exosomes, not the ones we produce. We, you know, we need it. It's part of our body's way to communicate with it, with itself. Yeah, very important. Yeah. So. Uh, so anyway, thymus and alpha one, wha, which does, by the way, it's it's approved in forty five. Is it forty five now? Forty five countries by the uh, you know fraud and death authority. Um, they approved it. Uh, which makes you kind of, but nevertheless, it's got to prove some good things got to prove too. Not only the junk, not only the poison. Okay. So, uh, so TA one, what they found is that, cause so, so when you get to, when you're in your forties, you're already low on your T cells, fifties, lower sixties, seventies, you know, we're not talking about a lot of T cells and this is why immunity fades over our lifetimes right now it's one of the reasons there's others but that's probably eh, close to being number one yeah okay so now thymus and alpha one but even if you're really sick you want to increase your t-cells you right even if you're young, 30 years old and you want to increase your your your, your t-cells um um so anyway that's what does us so thymus and alpha one is a natural peptide that will stimulate uh the production of t-cells and activate natural killer cells. So all of that stuff is what you need. So everybody should be on it if, if you have chronically fermenting cells. If you don't have chronically fermenting cells and you get into your 40s and 50s, you could start it as well. It's just twice a week. You do 14 days initially of an injection uh, in your belly with a small little insulin syringe um, of 30 units, which is 0.3 cc's small amount in your belly um you could do it here i guess you do it in your leg uh two times a week because it has a long half-life but very very important for immunity very very important for immunity they found that people getting chemotherapy because you know what happens is in chemotherapy it knocks down your white blood cells when it knocks down your white blood cells remember the white blood cells consist of of several different types right so you've got neutrophils, lymphocytes, eosinophils, basophils, monocytes. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, it knocks them all down. But, and so there's a drug they have that, 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 that the oncologist will, will give their uh, patients who are, have what they call neutropenia. It means their neutrophils are low. Penia always means low. Um, like osteopenia, 
means that you have low calcium concentrations in your bones. And then when osteopenia advances and you get really, really, really low, they call it osteoporosis. So penia means small. Um, and that's that. So anyway, so, but you also get a lymphopenia and all the other penias. So the, the, the oncologist will give you a shot of Nupagen which is granulocyte stimulating factor. It's an injection and that stimulates only neutrophils. That's absolutely important because your absolute neutrophil count has got to be over two. I don't, you know, the, they, the, 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 the witches and warlocks in the house of horrors, let your absolute neutrophils get down to like 0.5. The reason they're important because neutrophils are the ones who, when you when a bacteria enters your blood, immediately gets rid of it. Those are the guys that are immediately on the scene. Okay, they're called phagocytes. They're phagocytic. You know, there are other phagocytic cells, but the phagocytic means that eating. Okay, uh, uh, that's what pus is. Pus is just a bunch of dead bacteria and uh, phagocytes. Yeah. And I mean, some co a couple of yeah, other other waste material and stuff like that, but. Anyway, um, uh, so they give you the shot of Nupagen. Now your neutrophils come up. Good, because if they don't, you're going to get sepsis. You can get sepsis. Sepsis means bacteria in the blood, multi-organ problems, and, pro and likely death. Okay, you don't want to get septic, you know, and you can get septic uh, if you don't have the neutrophils. So that's really, really important. How can you get septic? How can you get blood? Uh, back, bacteria in your blood. All right, now. money, 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 you money, money. This is almond coming, money, money. Uh, how do you get bacteria in your blood? Brushing your teeth, yeah. Come here. What were you saying? Huh? Say it again, huh? Anyway, um, so, uh, from brushing your teeth, you can do it. You can do it and uh, a constipated bowel movement. Can you imagine? You could do it because when you, if you're constipated and you're, and you're squeezing like that. Um, here, you got to go down. Okay. Money. Bye, 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 um, <clears throat> You could, the bacteria from the, from the feces can actually go into the blood like that. Right. Um, and. So, uh. What else? Eating. Eating could do it. Eating can, uh, can do it. There are so many things. Bumping yourself, anything could do it. You can get bacteria in the blood. You have spontaneous sepsis and you can die. So absolute neutrophils, not percentage, but absolute neutrophils. I don't let them get below two. If it's below two, we can. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give you some nupagen or. And this is only gonna happen if you have, if you're getting chemo. Or or, or radiation therapy. All right. So now, uh, but it doesn't fix the lymphopenia, so your lymphocytes are still low. So okay, good. So now you're not gonna get septic and die. However, your Lymphocytes are low, so you're not, you're not, you don't, your T4s, your T8s, right? Your helper cells, your killer cells, your natural killers, all those are low. You didn't help, and that's what you need to get rid of the chronically fermenting cells. So what are we doing? There's nothing for it. Guess what does? TA1, thymus and alpha-1. It's going to keep those up, and they found that you can keep them up when people are getting chemo. Everybody needs to get it. And by the way, the way you get it from, I mean, is uh, that I've seen is uh, peptide science in America. That's where you can get it in America. In Europe, it's different. It's, I know it's a different world over there. Um, and there's different kinds of regulations. But anyway, peptide science is online. And you might even have them send it to you if you're in Europe. Or, or, uh, but it depends on customs in your country. So...
but get it. All right, see, let me just explain real easy. You're going to get a powder. You're going to order 10 milligrams. You're going to get a powder. Uh, it's a little vial with powder. You're going to get some back, back to, uh, from the pharmacy, some bacteriostatic water, you know, plain H2O. And with a big uh, 3cc syringe and a big fat needle, you're going to draw up two cc's of sterile water, put it into the vial, and then you don't even have to shake it. It'll become clear. Now... You throw, you put that needle away and you just use your little small insulin needles to take out 30 units in on an insulin syringe, 30 units. And you give yourself a shot. Easy, easy. No reason not to do it. So that it's too expensive. It's expensive. Shouldn't be that expensive. Anyway, what do you think of the blood type diet? Oh, wow. You all remember the blood type diet? Anybody familiar with the blood type diet? Well, eat right for your type was the name of the diet by a guy named D D D'Amato. D'Amato was a naturopath. And he was in, uh, I think I think he was in Sedona up near, uh, I think, or somewhere in, in Arizona. Wasn't he D'Amato? D'Amato. D'Amato. Anyway. Uh, so anyway. The idea is that your blood type is a reflection of your heritage, your ancestors. So if your ancestors lived in wherever they lived and the food they ate was related to their blood type. Well, we've got, you know, we've got A, type A, type B, type AB, and type O. So there's four. So well, anyway, I guess there's four dot parts of the, of the diet. Anyway, they, they, did, they did a study at the University of Toronto and they found that there was no relationship between the food that anybody ate and their blood type and their markers of health, right? Anything like that. I mean, and a lot of things like that too. So, But let me just, let me bring up common sense. And I don't know how, I don't know how that became such a big, it became a, a, a New York Times bestseller. That's how hungry people are for finding out the tr about the, tr the truth. Okay, now he's presuming that it's all presumption. There's no, there's no, it's all presumption. Okay. Um, amazing. I mean, he probably retired on that. I, I think, I think, I would have had, that he, it sold over what, eight, 10 million. It's translated like, 52 languages what now let me ask let me just ask you a question if the blood type is related to what we should eat because it's it's a reflection of our ancestors what about horses horses have seven blood types we've only got four a b a b and o they have seven so do you think some horses should never eat alfalfa, but they can eat, I don't know, I don't know, uh, crabgrass, right? Now, dogs are in trouble. Dogs are in big trouble. And I got I to gotta talk to Diamato about that if I ever run into him. Um, Dogs, canines have 13 blood types. 13 blood types, my God. So some dogs must, should stay away from uh, um, sausages. And bologna. Sausage is a bologna, but they can eat like uh, pork chops. We got to figure that out, right? I, I want to get a blood type so we can know how to feed our pets, right? And, and cats... Cats are uh, real simple. There's just three. They just have three. But anyway, all animals, I forget how many elephants have and all that. They all have different blood types, and it's not related to that. It's really many other things. So I'm sorry about that. About that. I think a lot of people like to find, like to do that. And this probably went over big in Asia because like in Japan, in Japan, your blood type is like, I don't know if it's true in Korea as well. 
But some people on their business card, you know, in Japan, when they when you meet someone, you go, and you hand them your business card like this, right? And then they take it and they look at it for a while. You have to look at it for a while. You can't just take it. And do it. No, you got to. Oh, also oh, going there. Oh, bad man. So anyway, <clears throat> some people have their blood type uh, in Japan. It was pretty common when, like, in the eighties, for people to have their their blood type on their business card, and 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 they and they and they, and they would say, uh, ah, yeah, he's that way because he's a he's a B or he's an A." So they really, really are into it. So they must have really loved this idea. But it gives you an excuse. Remember, a lot of these kinds of diets that think that humans are really different from each other um, in, in, in these kinds of things <clears throat> it gives you an excuse. Well, God, I, I got to eat dead animals because yeah, I mean, I'm my ancestors ate dead animals. So I got to eat dead animals. And, uh, uh, anyway, I don't think it's worth even reading the book because it's all... Diamato's imagination. I'm telling you, it's his imagination. Because humans are hum humans eat human food, and human food is when I'm I'm talking about natural. Our natural food is plants. Naturally, that's what we're equipped for. That's what we're instinctive. Your instinct, and if you tell me no, I. I I gotta have a steak, but I don't have a steak. I don't have a... And I feel much better when I have a steak. You know, it, I tried to go vegetarian, but I didn't have no energy. So I ate a steak and I'm ready to go. Give me a break. Listen, first of all, you don't get energy from eating protein, usually, unless you're, it you doesn't get turned into glucose. Uh, maybe the fat. Might yeah, might give you some, but it takes a while. You're not going to get the energy right away. Anyway, so anyway, but um, anyway, our natural diet is that, and also you got to realize too, if you eat whatever you eat, whatever you eat was given to you when you were young, before you even could talk. And argue, and they stuck these things in your mouth. They stuffed you. You remember? You remember when you were born? The minute you cried, it was. Argh. Right? That's it. So, you know, uh, so when we're born, they start, our, our parents start stuffing us. Right? And it's always the go to thing, right? And the guy, he's crying, give him a piece of this, give him a piece of that. Yeah. That's it, right? How do, well, so why do we have why do we have emotional eating? Why do we have all these weird appetites? <clears throat> because of that. But anyway, depending on where you grew up, depending on what you ate from the time that you uh, stopped drinking your mother's milk or whatever you, they do, uh, should have been your mother's milk. I hope you had your mother's milk. And if you didn't, give your child make sure your children get your mother her their mother's milk. Yeah, yeah. Um, from the minute you stop doing that, whatever your parents feed you becomes the food that you that form your appetites, that form your tastes. That it, and, and that you in the, you're not going to change that. You're not going to change that. So you want to do your child a big favor? Give him her food. And I don't there. And, and I don't know if you had anything other than him or her. I'm not sure about that. You got a guy's got. A, if you're not a him or. Her, Okay, anyway, I can't figure that out, you know. <clears throat> genetics, genes, gender. Genetics, genes, gender. There's an X and a Y chromosome. And if you got two Xs, it's called female. And if you got an X and a Y, it's called male. So you got an egg with two Xs, and you got an egg with an X and a Y. I mean, you got an egg, yeah, an egg. An egg with an X and another egg with a Y, or an, which is a sperm. You either got an egg and a sperm, and they, I mean, there's not a third thing. There's no third thing. There's no third gender. Anyway, but whatever you have, a boy or a girl, and oh, I was, I, I gotta, I gotta tell you, I was reading an article. 
I was, what was I? I can't remember what I was reading, but uh, they said, they were talking about the, the gender they were assigned at birth. You're not assigned a gender at birth. You look and you say, aha, there's a penis. There's a vagina. Ah, there's no assignment. You don't assign a, some, a somebody at birth being male or female. They come out that way. I, I, you know, the are we real? Did, has it come to this? Has it come to this, you guys? It comes, they either come out that way or actually, and I saw it because I used to be, I used to do obstetrics and um, before I was, went into internal medicine. Um, we saw a hermaphrodite, had a penis and a vagina. Sort of, well, yeah, kind of, not, 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 not good copies of either, but close, kind of like, a, but anyway, the point is this, there's not a third thing. What would the third thing be? Anyway. So feed them food that will not ever harm them, that, was, that they are designed to eat, and do that until they're five years old, six years old. Then you, you did it. You did it. You loved them. You gave them your love, and you gave them health. Why did you give them health? Because you didn't give them bad habits. They don't have to break it. When they're hungry, they're going to grab an apple or they're going to grab a cucumber. Or they're going to grab a carrot, or they're going to grab some lettuce, and they say, "We want to go out to dinner. Yeah, let's go have a salad. Let's go to that salad place. Yeah, that's what you're going to have, right? They're going to hang out with their friends. They might have pizza at that. Like, oh my god, they won't like it as much. That's good. That's a good thing. That's a great thing. That's a wonderful thing. Okay. So do that anyway. Um, and by the way, give them a choice. Give them a choice. Put put a little one year old. Uh, uh, like a one-year-old, you just maybe you're weaning it at one years old. Give him a choice. Say, hey, here's a cow here, and here's some apples. But, but, you know they can't you can't speak yet, but you just say, oh, okay, here. I don't think you're gonna ever. No, I don't think it's not that I don't think. I know, I know, you're never gonna find a human try to eat a cow try to eat a rabbit or anything or chi you know, there's a chicken and you think the, 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 the baby's going to say, well, I want to eat that. No. Okay. That's our diet. Our diet is pl plants and we're not too good at these don't work really well. If you want to bring down a, uh, how would you kill a cow with your hands or a bull? Not those, not, don't do what the sword, uh, what the bullfighters do with the sword. That's cheating. What do you do? Anyway. Okay. Uh, sorry, I went too far. Recommendations for uh, stage four, HER2, stage four, HER2 positive breast cancer. So, listen, do the same things. Live healthy. Eat healthy. Lots of soy. Lots of cruciferous vegetables. All different kinds of soy. Organic, make sure it's organic, make sure it's not GMO. Um, cruciferous vegetables, lots of cruciferous vegetables. Um, dr uh, make sure you're well hydrated. Do your, you know, all the things that we talk about, that you do all that. There's nothing specific about, you know, any particular type of, you're currently in remission, that's fantastic. Stay there, keep your colon clean, go to bed early, do all these things. Eat healthy, and I would also recommend that you take some of the uh, some of the drugs that we take for to eliminate the cancer stem cells, because that's what you got to worry about. Because the HER2 positive was only that particular group and cluster of cells that was in that particular microenvironment. Because a person, as you know, there are I mean many women that've got breast cancer could have like triple positive here and triple negative. In, in the, and when it went there because this is a different microenvironment. So remember, these genetic what do they call them? What do they call them? Genetic uh, mutations are not mutations. Sorry. Sorry. Not mutations. So anyway, <clears throat> um, that's actually good news. You know that. You know that's good news. Why is that good news? Because mutation is not much you can do about a mutation, right? Not much you can do if you're born, born with Hurler's syndrome. Not much you can do if you're born with Down syndrome. Not much more if you're born with an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. You know, 
Not much you can do. You can't un you can't change it. No. But this stuff you can change. Huh? Your PTN is down. Your P21 is down. Your P53 is down. We can get them back up. Oh. How? Food. Human food. Specifically cruciferous vegetables. Specifically. Uh cruciferous vegetables. Okay, now. Uh, so anyway, so the HER2 is only just, it's just a thing, the HER2. Don't worry about it. Um, but you want, so I would take ivermectin. You can take doxycycline, uh, prophylactic. You have to do it for, you know, forever. But I mean, just in small doses, doxycycline, 50 milligrams twice a day. Uh, ivermectin, uh, 12 milligrams twice a day. Even once a day would be fine. Uh, mebendazole, do a mebendazole, get a 500 milligram. Uh, they have it in 100 milligrams. We'll do one or two, the one a couple times a day. Just, just do that. And and and, and be doing your sip in seven to seven vitamin C. You want to keep those stem cells down. Uh, get some IVs of vitamin C. Go get some IVs of vitamin C. Keep those stem cells down. I mean, yeah. And keep yourself clean and moving and flowing and all that. Okay, so what is a nat and here's another question. What is a natural alternative to tamoxifen? Soy, 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 soy. Soy, 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 soy. We gotta come up with a if any of musicians out there, let's learn the soy song. Soy is very important. Chia is very important. Cruciferous vegetables are very important. Of course, garlic and onions are always important. but make sure whoever you're with ate it too. Um Especially if it's raw, right? Yeah, you know, raw garlic. Uh, so, um, but anyway, but all these foods are like super, super foods. And then, of course, you would do some spirulina, or um, yeah, if you can get, if you can get some, if you can get, uh, find out how to grow your own spirulina. I used to be able to get it in Bangkok, fresh spirulina, not the powdered tablets. Bah, just magic, 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 magic. All these foods are just magic. Uh, but do all that, do all that, and 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 meditate. Meditate means turn your mind off. Okay. Listen to your breathing. Listen very intently, intimately, deeply to your breathing. Understand <clears throat> nothing. Think about nothing. Just. And remember, that rhythm is the rhythm of life. That's the rhythm of life. And that rhythm that's keeping you in the flesh is the rhythm that sweeps across the oceans, that's in the breeze. You see the, I, I look outside, I see those palm trees swaying. It's the rhythm of life. I go down over here to the ocean, it's the rhythm of life. That rhythm of life is in there. Just listen to it. And don't go, and, you, and your mind wanders, just go right back to it. Just go right back to it. And what happens to your immune system, what happens to your body is it re equilibrates. We talk about doing a, what do they call it? Re, uh, reboot. Reboot. All right. Uh, I guess, I, what time is it? Oh, okay, good. You know what, you guys? I got to get. Uh, I can't, I got to get over to. Oh. Um. Wow. Wow. Uh, can aggressive metastatic prostate cancer be stopped with alternative therapies? Yeah, and it can't be stopped with conventional, which is why you're asking. So remember that. Please, everybody keep in mind, the conventional world has rarely, but not if it's aggressive. They they can rarely catch it early, cut it out. Blah, 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 rarely, rarely. N most don't. You cut it out. You 
it just comes back. It's now it's all over. I mean, it doesn't, we've talked about that before, but when you get past, when you get into stage three and four, there, there, there's no conventional. And ask, ask your oncologist. But yes, especially aggressive prostate cancer. Aggressive means probably in your bones, maybe lymphatics. Yes, 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 yes. We've got to find out what's, remember you guys, we've got to find out what's causing it. you got to find out, you've got to get rid of all of the parasites. you got to get rid of uh, uh, any deep d dental infection. you got to get that all checked out in the right way by a biological dentist and you got to do the parasite you got to get rid of that and you got to do detoxification and cleansing colon hydrotherapy you got to get rid of all the waste all the things that could possibly be causing cells to ferment to require require fermentation to survive okay you've got to eliminate that that's number one okay you do that and this kind of stops now now um and then, and then, and then, and then, if it's in your bones, if you got prostate, it's probably in your bones. Then doxycycline is really going to help with that too, right? And you don't have to do, it. but there's, yeah, there's there's a lot of things we can do. And, and eating a human diet, eating plants, e eating fresh vegetables, uncooked vegetables, plants. Find out how to do it. Remember, remember, I have a book. Where's that book? Where's my book? Anyway, I have a book. It's called Stop Making Cancer and uh, you can get it online, I guess. I should probably figure out a way of putting it on the website. But anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a recipe book for uncooked food to make it delicious. It's got to be delicious. It's got to be delicious. But you can do that. So if you've got aggressive prostate cancer, yes, and you need testosterone, by the way, because they're going to tell you you don't need testosterone. They probably put you on an androgen blocker. They probably gave you Lupron. They probably did things like that. Knocked out all your testosterone, which is crazy because it's low testosterone that results in prostate cancer, not high testosterone. Right? Think about it. You got a 25-year-old guy at Gold's Gym who's lifting and big and bulky, and he has an erection from the moment he wakes up until the moment he goes to sleep. He doesn't have prostate cancer. No, it's the guy who's 60, 65, 70, who can't get an erection. And when he works out, can't keep his muscles and his testosterone is low. And in fact, when the testosterone dips below 550 for any significant period of time, your risk of developing this um, um, chronically fermenting cells in your prostate is uh, higher. You want to get your testosterone back up to normal because your testosterone is important for your heart function, for your brain function, for your muscle function, everything, you know, everything. It's really, really an important uh, hormone. Is it, uh, it's not dangerous to take three, six and nine together. Not at all. Um, but again, you don't have to take oils and omegas and pills and stuff. Eat chia seeds, Black seed smoothie, a chia seed, six tablespoons of chia seed with a nut milk, and then you know do whatever else you want to it. I like it like that, and have that as a nice porridge and be nice and full. Then take three tablespoons of flax seeds, grind them up, make a, and put that in, in with a nut milk, and make another kind of smoothie which you want: blueberries, strawberries, whatever. Some spinach in it and kale, whatever. Drink that. You do that, and then and then when you're eating, have avocados and stuff like that. So the only time you want to use oils is when you're going to have salad just to make your salad. Uh, make a nice salad dressing, but there's lots of really good uncooked uh, salad dressings that you can get. Um, anyway, it's really cool. Yeah, Brazil nut milk. Would that be too much selenium? No way. It's the it's excellent, you guys. Excellent Brazil nut milk. Four Brazil nuts give you 200 micrograms of selenium. It's great. So you get more. It's good. It doesn't matter because this is bioavailable natural selenium. Thank you. I do. Yeah, you said you, you lose weight in the six hour by eating and only in the six hour window. Maybe you're not. Well, I don't know. Are you underweight? You get your like underweight? So I, you eat in the six hour. What would you do? Well, the six hour window, imagine if you're having, if you're having nuts and seeds, 60% of your, 60% of your diet is, is is fats nuts seeds uh and then the rest is vegetables uh yeah 
Now, remember, you don't have to do this for ever if you have chronically fermenting cells. Once they're no longer detectable, you can go to an 80-20 where 20% of your food is cooked. Uh, and if you just absolutely can't stand it, then eat it. But, you know, eat a, so eat a steamed um, uh, sweet potato. Uh, have some, uh, some brown rice, rice, some quinoa, things like that, you know, will help. Get, I mean, if you're like cachectic, you're, I don't know what you mean losing weight. Losing weight for most people is usually a good thing. They're, not, they're, not, they're usually happy about it. Um, so, so usually, so, so dinner is for me, someone's asking a question, well, uh, specifically every dinner is a salad. And I usually put in whatever le different lettuces I can find, um, tomatoes, avocado, uh, cucumber, carrot, uh, arugula, broccoli, cauliflower. I like all of them. Um, yeah, really big, and it's like totally full, totally full. Yeah. Go cop. And uh, what did you, hey, fantastic. So, uh, and cup of my cup. Ah, swai ma, yeah, swai ma. Hi, so, chai cup. Uh, anyway, this is cool. Yeah. All right. So now, uh, is dairy permitted? No, no dairy. Of, of all the things, dairy is like, uh, uh, dairy has casein. Casein is a, is a protein that makes mammals grow quickly. It helps them achieve their weight. They need to double their size in a certain amount of time so that they can become viable right? That's what, that's what mammals do. That's why mammals drink milk. And in the milk is casein. And then nature very carefully through all of its creatures, weans, not all of its creatures, only the mammals, right? Because, you know, lizards don't have breasts and neither do amphibians or snakes. Um, snake milk. No, no such thing. Anyway, so, um, so all the mammals that have milk they use casein, and that is a stimulates tissue proliferation big time. Well, that's really good because you need to grow when you're a baby, but there's a point at which you got to stop. And weaning is never negotiable with in nature. You just wean. The horse doesn't say, "Okay, go, go, hey, uh, go over and see that goat over there." I think. So anyway, casein turns out to be one of the most carcinogenic substances ever studied. That's the problem with dairy. That's the problem. However, I met this guy who did the studies because he did. We was determined, Italian guy, and he figured that he was did. The, you know, he had he had a big he had a restaurant and everything, um, and he found out that if you age provolone cheese to six years, is it? But, Four years, five years, six years, I forget. Anyway, there's a certain point at which you're, when you raise, when, when, when you age provolone, cheese provolone, um, that it loses its casein. Wow. Wow. Imagine that. Yeah, Doug Graham thinks we are a grain eater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I know. I know. Doug. I used to know him in, in New York. Yeah. Yeah, oats, rice, quinoa. Quinoa is not really a grain, but yeah. Uh, no pizza ever. Well, you know, listen, you got to have, uh, you got to have, listen, everybody, whenever, whatever you do, once the chronically fermenting cells are no longer discoverable and you change to an 80, 20 diet, 80% uncooked, 20% cooked. Once you do that and you still want to have a day once a year, whatever, where you really want to blow it, have a day. Do it. I mean, where you really, really blow it. I mean, do it. It's not, you know, it's not what we do occasionally, and I mean occasionally, that affects us. It's what it affects our biochemistry and affects our ability to heal and be healthy. It's what we do 
most all the time, mostly, all the time. 80%, 90% of the time, 90%. Of the time. You always go to bed early, but you're going to go, hey, I'm going to go out and party on Friday night. Okay. But most of the time, you go, you know, you got it. Just, just think of it that way. So have your blow it day and plan it. Say every two months, I'm going to have a blow it day. I'm going to wake up in the morning and I'm going to just. You, believe me, you won't even enjoy it as much as you think you would. But yeah, tizzy, tizzy, tizzy lish. Yeah. Yeah. So you can. How easy is it to change your habits? You give them raw broccoli and raw potatoes? Question mark. Raw broccoli is great. Yeah. Raw potatoes? No. By the way, I don't know if you guys ever ate raw corn, non-GMO. Raw corn is fantastic. It's better than cooked corn. Try it. Get a nice, good piece of corn. Raw broccoli, yeah. And, uh, you know, what you can do is you make a dip. You make a dip with your cashew cheese. You make a cashew cheese and you dip your broccoli like that. If you don't really, and that makes it easier. Or take your broccoli and put it into a dehydrator and it'll taste cooked. Dehydrate it. Dehydrate your cauliflower as well. And it tastes cooked. It tastes cooked. It tastes cooked. And you can put the, 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 the cheese on it, put it back, that, that cashew cheese, put that back into the dehydrator and it comes out and, whoa, you've got a, bro you got a broccoli, a cauliflower, cheese casserole. I mean, fantastic. Make kale chips also with that same cheese. Kale chips. Give that to the kids. The kids are going to say, whoa. I'm telling you. <laughs> Raw food dies. Oh, raw foodie. Raw foodie slut. Ah, cool. Where can I find a good nurse practitioner? Would it, uh, you know, I guess it depends on your state. I don't know. Uh, but there's lots of good... I mean, hope, hopefully there's nurse practitioners. They're probably better than, they're definitely better than most medical doctors. What about kidney damage over 110? What do you mean over 110? There's this one place. Ah, which um, not far from here that makes up. Um, this guy's an amazing. What's the word? They, what do they call those guys who make coffee? Coffee. Anyways, he's good. He gets the beans from they grow in Chiang Mai and they're organic and they bring them down and he roasts them himself and, and then he prepares them. So that organic coffee and the organic um, soy milk. I don't know what you mean about kidney damage over 110. You don't mean the age of 110. I'm not sure what you're meaning. Animal communicator. Car, car. I don't know what that means. Uh, oh, what over 110? Now, can you take another question? Uh, TikTok topic. Can you take too many vitamins? Yeah, as a matter of fact, you can. And the least you can take is the better. You want to eat really he healthy. So that you don't need to supplement because your diet is sufficient. But you're going to eat the certain, you're going to take certain supplements. You're only going to take like iodine, um, maybe some thyroid. If you need it, you probably will for a while, natural thyroid. Um, vitamin A, vitamin D, and vitamin C. Those are the big ones. Um, and, you know, if you're vegan, then you're going to need uh, maybe a, a B complex to get your B12s up. once a week. Yeah, it's uh, but th th those are the those are the <clears throat> the main ones, and then and then of course all your minerals: selenium, molybdenum, uh, manganese, magnesium, 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 and boron, boron, boron. Yeah. That's it. I mean, and zinc. Did I say zinc? <clears throat> Very, these are all like really, really important. You'll get them in foods, but you want to get a little extra. Just like you get the vitamin C in foods, but you want to get a little extra. Okay, so here. 
F Facebook. What supplements can you recommend for a free free of cancer after a low lobectomy, a lower low lobectomy, to stay strong and healthy? Well, what, we what I just mentioned, right? So, um, you know, I iodine. Vitamin C, vitamin A, vitamin A, 40,000 units a day, vitamin D, 30,000 units a day until you get up to a level of around 90 to 120 and then figure out, I mean, do I need to go down a little bit or whatever? Keep your level around there, your vitamin D. Vitamin A, look, you want to be at the very top of the level of the reference range. It's hard to get there. Taking 40,000 units a day of vitamin A, very hard to get up there. Very, very important. Uh, and then vitamin C, you're going to do 10 grams in a liter over 12 hours. Sip it slowly. Okay, those are big. Those are those. You know that and the iodine and the minerals, and you're you're okay. You know, and then you eat healthy. Don't get in. You know, you can do mushrooms, right? Mushrooms are going to be really helpful. You could uh, for your immune system. There's so many things you could do. Astragalus. I mean, there's just so many things you could do. Quercetin, uh, curcumin. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I can't say no. Don't take them. But I, uh, you can. You can also. You want to eat, and you, you want. You want your food. If your food is real, if your food is organic, you first of all, you won't eat, need a lot to eat. You're going to be healthy. You're going to sleep early. You're, gonna, you're keeping your bowels clean. You're doing an enema in the morning. Now, <clears throat> now I start chemo tomorrow, and I could use some guidance on what we probably got this too late. I'm sorry on what my diet should be. I'm doing a cancer fighting diet now, and only eating within a four hour window every day. I'm only consuming what I believe to be cancer fighting foods. Are there more or different things I should consider while on chemo? Any help would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. I am determined to beat this thing. Okay, well look. Uh, and I'm willing to do anything I have. I plan you to be here for my family for a long time. And this, I, you, you, you know, I, I love that. You know, and we're all, I, and I meet so many people that are, you know, yeah. And I meet so many people that are parents of young children. And, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just so <clears throat> what you should do. Yeah, my guidance. Listen, on, on, on my uh, website, drlody.com, there's, there's a, a Stop Making Cancer video series. And, you know, I would say get that and, and follow that. But also keep in mind that I'm not sure what you think, what you're eating. But remember, uncooked foods, and what we, and we've been talking about, a brassica vegetables, 60% of your diet's got to be uh, got to be healthy fats from chia and flax, okay, hemp seeds. Um, Do juices, smoothies, the porridge. Don't use fire on your foods. Um, you can eat in a four window hour, a four hour window. You can eat in a six hour window. Um, keep your bowels clean. You're starting chemo. You're starting high dose chemo. You should rethink that and probably see if you can find a practitioner who knows how to do insulin potentiated low dose chemo or ask your oncologist if they, and this is Sean, ask your ontology, oncologist if they'll do metronomic chemotherapy. Okay. Cause it's, cause you don't want the damage from the chemo, right? You don't want the damage from the chemo. And I'm not sure your situation at all. So I really not telling you what to do. I'm just saying my suggestions are I'd find a way not to get high dose chemo um, because you do want to be here for your family. You do. That's what you want to do. So you'll want to do anything that's there. You can read about these chemos. Read about the fact that high-dose chemo causes metastasis. Yeah, the primary tumor is gone, and they say, oh, you're in remission. Oh, nine months later, it's big trouble. Now it's big trouble. And don't get injections from those people. Get no spike protein injections. Now, you're not going to beat it. What you want to do is restore your health. You want to restore balance in your body. Restore health. Remember, cancer again is a is a body is a bug. 
group of cells adapting to a situation where they're not getting their biological needs met. Okay, so they, you're going to change your biochemistry. You're going to go to sleep early. You're going to do all these other things. Keep your colon clean. Do all these things. You're going to change your biochemistry so your cells don't need to do that uh, dance anymore, right? Okay, all right. Well, I'm 90 years old. Do you take care of prostate issues? Yes, I, I scrapped 30 years ago. It is flaring up. Will ozone therapy help this? Yeah, I mean, ozone is absolutely helpful. But if you're 90 years old, what you want to do also is get some hormone replacement, get your testosterone up, get your uh, erectile apparatus working and your um, libido up and uh, start cleansing your prostate, okay, ejaculations. You can do ejaculations at 90. There are guys in the Himalayas, I mean, in the... Um, Ahuns is 110. They're getting they're getting young girls pregnant up there. 110. All right. So, um, but keeping that flow. So ejaculations at least 18 a month, right? Actually, 30 a month would be good. Um, and uh, uh, stop. Eat uncooked food. Eat uncooked food. It's gonna. Now you might not want to. It might not be your habit, but it's okay. Now, if it, you said you scrapped it 30 years ago, so I guess you got rid of it 30, it's coming back. Well, it, it, depending on what it is, if it's in your bone, and there's some of these there's some of these things like doxycycline is really important for you because it'll help prevent the prostate from going to the bones. It'll help do that. And you want to do you want to do the other things too. But you got to get your hormones back. You got you to work with somebody. Call me. Make an appointment. Let's have a talk and uh, uh, a consultation. You got to work with somebody who knows this kind of stuff. Uh Great, 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 great. So, Kathy, so you got the. Uh, 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 so, what is my th okay? So, so the, what are your thoughts on Fasodex injections for estrogen, progesterone positive, uterine sarcoma? Yeah, we were talking about sarcomas earlier. Fibro. Uh, um, this is the, the sarcoma of the uterus. Is the muscle. Um, It's a, it doesn't matter that it's uterine sarcoma or it's breast cancer or ovarian cancer or colon cancer or, or pancreatic cancer. They all have estrogen receptors. They don't check them all on all some like they don't usually check for colon. Sometimes they do. They don't usually check for pancreas, but sometimes they do. Nah, I don't think they do. But anyway, again, it's go back to remember you a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, um, soy. You don't want to. Get a shot of anything that's going to knock out your system and make it more unbalanced. These shots that make things unbalanced don't, don't, don't help. They don't help. So you want to remember you got soy, but you want to, you want to do it healthy. So anyway, that's very good. I'm glad you got uh, that. And I didn't get everybody you got. I didn't get everybody today, but detoxing kids from vaccines. Oh, wow. Yes. Wow. How old kids? Send me this question again next week. How old are the kids? What kind of vaccine? What are you talking about? They're the only. Yeah. Okay. So you guys, it's really late. I and I, I got a, a person to see a uh, consultation. So, so what Namaste. Namaskar. Aloha. And uh, see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you for coming.